Wherever you find yourself on the journey of being a part of Anchor Point Church, day one or day 42 or, or year 42, we're just hoping that today will continue to encourage you and bless you as we look at God's scripture together. So, um, how was you guys week? Weird weather. That one day was really weird. It's like 20 in the morning and then minus 10 at night. I was crazy. But I heard it was supposed to be like 16 tomorrow, which is awesome. So, or 17. Praise God. Oh, and Tuesday. Awesome. So I would, I would imagine, if we're honest, uh, it's a safe bet. There, there are some of us in this room, if we're really honest, who didn't have a great week. I ask the question, and you say, great. And then inside, you're actually like, no, it's actually terrible. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. You're feeling discouraged or confused or terrified or ashamed or torn open or just kind of meant just flat. Or, and then that. Dude, that's okay. I'm, I'm, we're so happy that you're here. It's okay to be like that. We're glad that you're with us. You're in good company. And maybe I asked that question to you and you are actually doing great. You had an amazing week and there, there's joy and hope and you're looking to the future with all kinds of anticipation. And that's awesome. If that's you, praise God. He is good. We're glad you're here and you're also in good company. So let's begin this morning, whether wherever you're at in the spectrum of men to great or wherever in between. Uh, with good news. I want you to know that Jesus sees you, like the real you, and he sees you and he's crazy about you. He, even on your worst day, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he loves you, and he wants you to remember that he died for you, and that he rose for you, and that he forgives you, and that he wants to set you free to be the man or woman that he has created you to be. That's the good news. So wherever you find yourself this morning, just hear that. And so, I don't know about you, but I can very easily forget that good news. I can, based on how I feel or how I think that you feel about me or how I experienced that thing the other day, I can very easily forget this good news. And this has all kinds of fallout for my life, for my family, for my friends, for this church, for my neighbors. Anyone else feel that? I can forget the good news. Um, and I, I love to read. Anyone else like to read books? Love it. And there's a few books I reread, but there's this one book I've read like five times, and I have highlighted certain parts with different color highlighters. You almost can't even read it anymore because I've gone over it so many times. Um, unfortunately, the content of the book, I'm still working on how to actually embody what it's just talking about. Um, but the opening of the book, he, he asked this question that I wanted to pose to you guys this morning. It goes something like this. How does Jesus see you? What is his disposition towards you? And I wanted just to sit with that question for a minute before we even dive into it. How does Jesus see you? And what is his disposition towards you? going to be many different images and thoughts. I imagine if we were to all share our thoughts, some would be accurate, some would be distorted, some would be helpful, some would be harmful, uh, some would be breathtakingly true, and some would be devastatingly false. And this is one of the reasons, it's not the only reason, but this is one of the reasons we gather together and learn from the scripture. We're learning together, we're gathering together to, to get to know who God is, and what God is actually like. And so, who God is, how he sees you, how he sees the world around you, all of these things matter. And so we have to come face to face that, you know what, we probably have wrong pictures, we have wrong ideas, we have wrong beliefs. We sometimes are led too much by our feelings about who God is, and we have to kind of surrender those things to God and come afresh to the scriptures, come afresh in the power of the spirit to, to learn and to experience and to know God as he really is, right? That's what we're doing here. It's not just so that I can off information to you, and you can leave forgetting 97% of it, is that we would encounter the God who is love, and that that would transform us and change us. 
This matters on so many levels, but when we get to know and experience and see God as he is, we cannot help but overflow and tell others about him. When we encounter the God who is actually good, like Heather was talking about this morning, who gives us good stew, who gives us good gifts, who gives us good things, who sees us as we are and doesn't turn away, that's something to tell other people about. That's something that, that's worth sharing. The God who saves, the God who loves, the God who heals, the God who rescues and redeems and sets free. So we're coming together, we're going to sit under the truth of the story of God, and we're going to get to know um, and, and be known by the God it revealed, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so today, we are starting off a little mini-series that we're calling Sent, so we're going to be back in the Gospel of Matthew. We took a month off and we did the series on the Holy Spirit, and so after two months off, and now we're back in Matthew chapter, end of Matthew chapter 9, in the first few verses of chapter 10. And we're going to be looking at the doctrine of evangelism. And so of sharing, displaying, and embodying the good news of the kingdom of God. And this, of course, ties into what we've been talking about over the last few years as a community. Um, we who are following Jesus in this room are invited into an apprenticeship to Jesus. We are invited into a lifelong journey of becoming a human being fully alive in the kingdom of God right here and right now in the everyday, ordinary stuff of your life. And this happens through learning to live life in the spirit, like we talked about last week, learning to live life in community with the people around you, learning to embrace and embody new habits and practices. And again, by learning the truth of who God is and what he's up to found in the scriptures. So we've used this triangle graphic many a times. So we, we're learning this whole process is becoming aware of the fact that so much of the brokenness and the sadness and the, um, the misliving we experience in our lives is because we've oriented our lives around ourselves. We become the center of everything. And so when we get stuck there, we, we actually feel stuck or stagnant, we're disintegrated, we're broken apart, and we, we're kind of isolated. No one really knows us, and we don't really know anyone in that space. God comes and finds us and rescues us, invites us into life with him, where he is the center. And in that place, we reorient and learn how to live life all with a whole new vision for what it could be. And that's be, being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. Or we move from a place of being isolated to, to experiencing intimacy, knowing and being known. We move from a place of being uh, disintegrated, looking one way on the outside, and inside we're a disaster. To a place of being formed, transformed into the image of Jesus. A place, uh, and then finally, um, just kind of living life just stagnant, like not really having any purpose, to be, being given this purpose, this mission in, in God. His kingdom. So that's the transfer that transformational journey that we want to be continually kind of reminding us of, putting that before you guys. This is the vision of what we're about. We want to be people who orient their lives around God. We want to see his kingdom come in Allison as it is in heaven. And that's the only way that's possible. Lives oriented around ourselves will not see that vision accomplished. So we are going to think through, like, what are these goals of being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did? How do these goals work together in this whole idea of evangelism or mission, or what we've been talking about this year for our vision of, like, uh, how do we learn to love our neighbors as ourselves? How do we learn to share the good news of the gospel? How do we learn to step out in prayer for people? How do we learn to use our spiritual gifts, not only in this room, but on our, like, on our cold sack or in our workplace, all those things? We're going to be looking at that, and we're going to think that all of these things, today though, the goal is like, all of these things are actually inextricably linked. Being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did are linked together. We can get kind of full of passion and, and, and vision and want to just go do the stuff that Jesus did without actually spending time with him and learning him to, or allowing him to reshape our character in the process. So the mission is to announce, embody, and display the kingdom of God. This is what we're about here in our community. This is what we're invited into by Jesus. So uh, we just got back uh, last week from a little mini family reunion of sorts with our family. And um, as we were hanging out one night, I, many of you guys know my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, Mel and Jer. And so we were hanging out this one night, and they were um, talking. And I had this, I, this kind of revelation, like, oh, you know what? I think they have the gift of evangelism. And the, the reason it, I kind of realized that is that every time Mel and Jer start something new, they tell everyone about it. There's the good news of edamame. There is the good news of cold plant. There is the good news of sriracha on everything. There is the good news of paddleboarding. There is the good news of Ted Lasso. Yeah. There is the good news. Amen. 
Yeah. There's the good news of weighted vests. And way back in the day, there's the good news of gluten-free living. So they're all about, <laughs> if it has changed their life, they're going to tell you about it. And that's good. That's a gift. We need to be like that. And so all of these things actually have had a real impact and change in their lives. And because that was true, they are more than willing to tell you about it. Sometimes you're like, I'm good, bro. I don't want a weighted vest. Stop telling me about the weighted vest. And I mean, yeah, Shrub is amazing. I will give them that. And paddleboarding is super fun. But the point I'm trying to make is this, that Jesus is good. Jesus wants to make himself known. And we are invited to by him to, hey, tell other people about me. Tell other people about your experience of me. Remember how I've actually changed your life? Maybe you can tell someone about it. Maybe you're encountering someone who is stuck, and you remember how you were stuck, and you can tell them that there's this person who can actually help you out of this situation. He wants to make himself known to you and the hurting and helpless and lost you, like the actual you, but it doesn't stop there. He wants to make himself known through you out into the hurting world around you. So he wants to make himself known to you and then through you. This is the principle of the gospel we talk about all the time. Everything God has done to you and in you and to you, he now wants to do through you. This, that was the intro, guys, on what we're going to be talking about today. We're, we're going to be getting back to that question I started with, um, which is the first source of mission that we're going to look at, which is drum roll, please. The heart of Christ. That's where we're going to start for this one. So I want to give a little context um, before we read the scripture together. So we're going to be in the same seven verses between now and Easter. And uh, these are the, at the end of chapter 9 of Matthew and going into the very beginning of chapter 10. And so um, this is Matthew, his biography of the life of Jesus. And the verses that we're going to read from are, are what you can get consider, like, what I'm actually in the whole narrative are a little bit of a bookend of what we looked at together for most of last year. So Matthew 4.23, if you remember back, you know, months ago, if we read this verse that says, let me just flip there, Matthew 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and illness among the people. If you flip over to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, you read, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and illness. These are book-ending the Sermon on the Mount, and the miracles of grace that we just went through together. So in chapters 5 through 7, we learn that through the authoritative word of Jesus, what life in the kingdom looks like. This is the Sermon on the Mount, or the teaching of Jesus. And then in chapters 8 and 9, we learn what the kingdom of God looks like in work, actually displayed and lived out. So this is the demonstration um, of that in the lives of real people, where Jesus, we read, he heals lepers, he calms storms, he raises the dead. This is the touching of Jesus. So we're at the beginning of a new part in the story where Jesus is going to be inviting these 12 people, these disciples that he's, and, and apprentices that have been living life with him to come and do what he did. Hey, you've been with me. You're slowly becoming like me, and now it's time that you start to do what I did. So Jesus' word and work is to continue to go on through his apprentices. That was true then, and it is true now. You have a role to play in God's glorious mission is what I want to tell you. And this mission is to reunite heaven and earth and to live out God's way in God's place. And so this is what we're going to be thinking through and looking at and learning through over the next four weeks. We're going to be looking at the heart of Christ today, and then next week, Jillian will be talking to us about the importance of intercessory prayer, and we've got a couple more after that. So if you guys are able, I would invite you to stand. We're going to read God's word together, and then we're going to think through how the heart of Jesus is the, is the main source. So if you can, if you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Pray with me. Father, we so long to know you and be known by you. And I ask today, Lord, as we look at this beautiful text, that you would reveal yourself to us. Jesus, that we would um, catch a glimpse of you gazing on us and would our minds be blown by your facial expressions and by the way that you actually are. And so we want to lay aside all of our own ideas of who you are, all of our own beliefs about who you are, all of our own um, assumptions about who you are, and we just want to trust you or that you have, you have something clearer and better and more accurate for us today. And so, Lord, would you come speak by your Holy Spirit to us? I ask, Lord, that you would take the words I've prepared, would you multiply them, would you um, empower us to receive what is from you, and then if it's anything from me, just let it fall to the ground. And so, Lord, we entrust our hearts and minds to you this morning. We're grateful for each person here. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Do you guys remember uh, being a kid or a parent or having an older sibling and a teacher would tell you to do something and you would just wonder why? 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 And then it would typically not have a good answer. It's like, because I told you so. I want you to do it because you're annoying me and I want you to stop or whatever it might be. So I wanted to start there this morning. Like, why mission? Why are we doing this? Do we have to do it? What is the purpose of this? Um, do we do this because we feel guilty and need to go do something about it? Is God trusting us to do everything? He can't do anything himself? No. But let's start. Why is there mission? Why is a good place to start? Knowing our why ties us to the vision and keeps us going when things get difficult. And when our why is compelling, it sustains us in difficult times. So the answer is this. Why is there mission? Because Jesus' heart goes out to people. The first principle of mission is this. Jesus feels for people. So the mission we're talking about is actually Jesus is, is given to us by Jesus. This is not us as an elder team coming up with some, ah, what are we going to do this year? This is the mission of Jesus. And it's sustained, and the source of this is the heart of that Jesus displays as, it, as it's going out to people. So there's mission because Jesus feels for people, all people. Not just people in uh, the 1040 window or in abject poverty, people who are living next to you, your Domino's delivery guy, political leaders. He cares about all people, he cares about you. His heart goes out to you. Because the heart of Jesus' mission is meant to touch and heal to the uttermost. It's for every single human being. Remember, when we think about Jesus, it's so important for us to remember that he is God with skin on. He came to experience to the deepest, deepest depths what it is to be human, and simultaneously came to reveal to us to the deepest depths what God is actually like. So when we're confused about like, hey, what is God like, we remember he's like Jesus. Jesus came to display and embody and remind us and reveal to us what God is actually like. So when Jesus came and took on flesh, he came and, and, and stepped into our story, into our brokenness, into our pain. He is well acquainted with the pain and difficulty of the human life in this broken world. In other words, Jesus, in other words, Jesus feels for people because he gets it. He's lived here. He's walked here. He's lived amongst us. He's lived amongst all kinds of people betraying him and turning their back on him. He is referred to as the suffering servant. He is well acquainted with grief. Jesus wept when his close friends died. Jesus was scorned. Jesus was mocked. Jesus was overlooked. Jesus was pushed aside. Jesus was human. We do mission because Jesus feels for people because he gets it. His heart goes out to you and I and every other person you could ever imagine. So where does mission take place? Does it take place overseas specifically? Does it take place, you know, like in Burundi 
or in the Congo. This is what I learned this week uh, in one commentary. Where does mission take place? Anywhere there is human pain. Anywhere there is human pain, Jesus' heart reaches out towards that person. All human pain is mission material. Jesus feels for those in pain, which absolutely includes your neighbors and your nurse and your nanny and your nemesis, but it also includes you. Jesus feels for you in your own stories, past, present, and future of pain, and his very heart is moved even towards you tonight. And so we need to catch a fresh vision. If mission is actually going to happen, if we're actually going to follow through with what God's called us to, we need to have a fresh vision of who this God is. Who God is. The God who feels and whose heart goes out. The God um, and what and what that heart can do in you and through your life and out to the world around you. So we read this morning, Jesus is doing all these incredible things. And then there's this line that, that says this. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion. When he saw the crowds, it's, it's kind of a striking line. What a powerful statement. Have you ever felt seen, like in a healthy way? You felt understood or valued or, or like validated or celebrated? That's a, that's a good feeling. And you're actually like noticed. It's, it's a longing for all of us human beings. And it's, it's the antidote for what so many of us struggle with in our day to day lives. And that's the issue of shame. Shame, what it does is it tells us we are too high. We are too far gone. We are too broken. We are too sinful. We are too embarrassing. So we better just hide. That, that being seen, being exposed, being known for who, who we really are will only result in us being rejected and, and abandoned and scorned. And for many of us, unfortunately, this has actually been our experience. And as other people, as other human beings are not always good. So God is always good, so we can't, it's easy for us to conflate, you know, how other people have reacted to us to how God would react to us. And this is, again, why the, the, the gospel stories and Jesus' life are such good news for us. Okay, so shame, shame tells us where to hide. And that, that story that shame is telling us over and over and over again is about our unlovability. And that our unlovability will only result in what we most deeply fear, to be rejected and pushed aside and to not that want, like, for people that want nothing to do with us. And this is one of the most effective weapons the enemy uses to keep us from the life God has for us. We keep, we keep ourselves in hiding and, in, and out of community, and we keep ourselves just kind of rehearsing that story. And the more we believe it, the more we, we live into it, and the more it becomes actually true. And so what we see here, what, what like science can actually prove, is that there is much healing in being seen. Specifically being seen in our real broken state, like as we really are. And, and not only just being seen, that's, that's part of it. But the healing takes a deeper effect when one is able to see themselves being seen. We talked about this before. Like this is, this is part of the, the, the whole gospel message is like, and why we even remember the cross and all these things. is like we need to see Jesus seeing our brokenness and not turning away. Because we can keep our head down and just like, here I am, God, I'm full of shame. And like, what, you know, we're kind of afraid to see what he's even like. And to be disappointed and be kind of like, Whoa, like barely able to look at us. And that goes back to that first question I asked you guys this morning. The way we heal and the way that God wants to work in and through our lives, specifically in our stories of shame, is he wants us to see him seeing us and not turn away. And, and, and holding our gaze and lifting our hands. Say, yeah, I know it all. I know every single thing that's ever happened to you, that you've ever done, that you will ever do, that ever will happen to you, and I still choose you. I still love you. I still am able to heal you. I want you. I'm crazy about you. Is that good news? That, that is what brings us out of shame and into the life God has for us. So that, that line, when, when he saw the crowd, that's the thing. Jesus, like God in, in the flesh, is coming and seeing us, seeing the people around you as they really are. And he's not turning away. What we read next is that he actually had compassion on them. It doesn't, like, it's not, Ugh, I want nothing to do with you. I'm going to look away and be done with you. How did Jesus see you? Back to that question. He sees you with eyes of compassion. You guys want to learn a really difficult Greek word? 
All right, this word, compassion in the Greek, is splaganizomai. Splaganizomai. That's an Italian. I had to do an Italian accent there. But splaganizomai means literally to feel in the viscera or to be moved in the inward parts, to have pity. It's an ancient way of referring to what rises up from one's innermost core. So when Jesus sees you, he has compassion. When he sees you as you really are, not the buttoned up Sunday best. No, we didn't just yell at the kids on the way to church. We're great. But the real you. He has compassion. That's what rises up into the innermost core. It's not embarrassment or anger. It's compassion. In God's self-disclosure statement to Moses in Exodus 34, he describes himself as the compassionate and gracious God. So this is who God is, and this is what God does. Jesus is what God looks like, and so when we look at Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, we can trust that Jesus is embodying the very nature and heart of God. So the deepest heart of Jesus, then, here is compassion. To feel his gut. The, the, some of the translations talk about your bowels. Your very inner person is moved towards you. So what we've been learning through Matthew's gospel is that Jesus, time after time, is attracted to the fallenness and brokenness of people. He has come to undo what sin has done. He's come to give back to us rebellious humans our humanity. And so he moves towards and not away from people who are broken. People like you and me. People like your neighbors and your family. People, in short, who need compassion. People who need to be seen and need to see him seeing us and him not looking away. So getting back to this idea of mission and evangelism. For mission and evangelism to work, you and I need to sit and know, sit with and know the compassionate and gracious God. That's where it begins. We sit with and know this God. We allow him to see us as we are, and we allow him to, allow him to move towards us with compassion. That's the beginning. That's, that's the, the, the beginning that we return to over and over and over again. It's not like, yeah, I was saved in, in 1986, and that was it. It's over and over, day after day, let's go deeper and deeper in that compassion. He has compassion on them because, it says in the next verse, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So one of the key things to notice here is what, what isn't said. So God is always able to look to the deepest parts of who we are. This is true. And uh, one commentary I read this week says this. Mission is not motivated by Jesus' disgust for people because they are sinful. Mission is motivated the more, Jesus is motivated by the more appealing fact that Jesus is compassion for helpless and hapless people. It's not like, deal with this sin. Oh my goodness. They are helpless. They are hapless. How can I step in and help them? It is our helplessness that motivates Jesus' mission. We are dead in sin, which means literally we can do nothing. When you're dead, you can't do anything. We were lost. We were blind. We were stuck, etc., etc. Jesus sees the harassed and helpless. He sees that there's more going on underneath the behaviors that he wants to address. He wants to get to the root of the issue, not just the fruit of the issue. So, so much of our sinful behavior and brokenness is because there's something deeper going on that he wants to address, and deal with, and heal. Anyone ever felt helpless? No. Nope. Lord and Messiah. Man, life can be completely overwhelming. We are, co we are constantly inundated with this barrage of ideas of what your life should look like, could look like. This is what the good life is. That is what the good life is. This is what the good life is. I mean, we were just in Florida. Man, the good life is appealing. Like It's like, I don't have money for it, but it's, it's more of this and more of that. And so without the framework that we see, like going back to this whole idea of, of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus as teacher, without the framework of life under God's rule, we can be absolutely overloaded with all sorts of unhealthy permissions or pseudo freedoms. If only you had this, then you would have a good life. Just do it. If you feel like it, just do it. And this can overwhelm us. We are helpless to that idea that we're barraged with over and over and over again. I have this, when I think about this, there's, um, Timothy and I joke about this often, how we don't like to make 
we get overwhelmed easily making decisions. And so there's, I don't know if you guys have seen these newer like fountain Coke machines where it's like a, a screen, instead of having like a Coke and a Diet Pepsi and a Sprite and a whatever, all these different things, there's just one big screen and you can make and one thing to put your cup under, but there's like 8,000 different variations of what you can do. It's like lemon, vanilla, Diet Coke with sweet tea or whatever, it's just overwhelming. And that can feel like what life is sometimes. There's so many options. There's so many things. And it, it's just like we're, we're helpless. Like we're just sitting there like, uh, I don't know. Just go back to the empty fountain cup because you don't know what to do. Life can be overwhelming. And equally, we can become overwhelmed with the yoke of religion if we're not careful. And Jesus will have much more to say about this and has already said things about this. We so quickly can forsake grace for legalism. Friendship for duty. Behavior modification for deep transformation. Stapling fruit onto the, onto the tree of our lives rather than him doing the deep work in our roots that needs repair. These things keep us helpless and hapless and harassed. Because not only to mention these things, in the spiritual realm, there's a different reality going on too, that we have a real enemy who is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy all of God's good and beautiful creation including you. He will do anything and everything to break you down and keep you down, to lie to you, to deceive you. So we are in need of help. We cannot do anything to please God or earn what we're longing for in our own strength. We just cannot do it. We need help. And the good news is he's the, he knows this. He knows this. He sees us. He has compassion on us because he knows that we are helpless. We are harassed. We are like sheep without a shepherd. God sees us as helpless and harassed before he sees us as sinful and sinister. This is true of you, and this is true of the people around you. But of course, the good news is that Jesus comes to us as the good shepherd. He comes to offer us a new way of seeing life. He comes to offer us his own life. He welcomes us in. He comes to um, give us his spirit like we've been learning about. He comes to rescue us. Jesus comes all the way into our deepest, darkest despair to rescue us and redeem us and come and shepherd us into the good life. Jesus' mission of compassion will eventually lead him to the cross. His compassion leading him all the way down into the deepest, darkest depths of our depravity. He sees all of it for what it is. He sees it as barriers to humanity experiencing the life and love of God. Our delusions of grandeur, our deceptions about what is right and wrong, our selfishness, our ongoing distraction, our, the evil within us, the devil working outside of us to, to, to deceive us, all of these things keeping his beloved creation in chaos and in bondage. First Peter says this, and he himself talks about Jesus, what he does on the cross, he bears our sins in his body on the cross, so that we too might die to sin and live to righteousness. It's for it is by his wounds that we were healed. He's saying about the Jesus paid it all, all the him I know. So Jesus comes and he enters real time and real space and he decides to do something about these people who are helpless and who are harassed. On the cross, Jesus laid down his very life for your life. His actual, sinless, perfect, holy, beloved, cherished life for your actual life. Your helpless, harassed, and sinful, and broken, impoverished life. He took that life, the pain, the shame, the helplessness, the harassment into his own body for your sin. To put it to death once and for all so, so that you can be brought back to new life in him and with him. A life free of shame, of sin and death. A life in union with God. A life completely undeserved but wholly given to you as a free gift. Jesus saw you. Jesus sees you. And Jesus will see you. And his heart will be moved out towards you in compassion. Day after day after day. Even on your worst day, you have to remember this. Jesus is still crazy about you. So in all of this, if, if all of this is true, I would imagine maybe we're catching a glimpse of thinking about mission differently. I mean, cold showers at Amame are great, but this is literally the best news you could ever have. So how do we bring this into our own lives, apprentices to Jesus, called into his mission? So disclaimer, like, 
we just talked through over the last seven weeks the whole idea of needing to be empowered by the Spirit for any of this to happen. So a lot, I'm not going to say a lot of things that we've already said in the last seven weeks, so go back and listen to those sermons. But the idea is simply this. We can't do any of this, be on mission, without being empowered by the Spirit. So God knows this. He very graciously, lavishly gives the Holy Spirit for us because he knows that we need the Spirit to help us to bring order to our chaos, to get us unstuck, and so much more. So that being said, compassion, getting back to that, the heart of Jesus is the main source for our mission. So we are empowered by the Spirit, but the Spirit is going to keep bringing us back to a deeper revelation of the heart of Christ for mission to actually work. Does that make sense? The Spirit empowers us to see Jesus and what he really did for us right here and right now. So how can the Holy Spirit empower us to, to, to the place where we can announce with conviction and with joy, we can embody and we can also display the very heart of Jesus to the helpless and harassed people all around us. Um, well, we have to start here. We have to remember the old adage that says this, you cannot give what you do not yourself possess. You can't give what you don't have. So for those of us who don't yet follow Jesus, today could be the day you first experience the compassion of Jesus. That his movement towards you, your state of helplessness and being harassed, let him draw near to you this morning. Let him meet you in your pain. Let him feel you. Let him see you. Let him let yourself see him seeing you as you are. And then see what happens. Now, if that's you this morning, you already have fallen Jesus. Come after. If you have questions, I would love to talk with you and pray with you and get you closer to him. But for most of us in this room, most of us are followers of Jesus. I think it's really important for us to remember where we come from, to keep in touch with our story, not to dwell in the past and and always remember our shame and our brokenness, but to remember that being seen by Jesus, his compassion, first gripping our heart, how Jesus met us in our sin and shame and rescued us. But not only that, um, we must stay in an awareness that Jesus is constantly moving towards us with compassion even still. He is co-suffering with us the hardships of life. He is with us in the mess and pain of real existence. That there is an ongoing work, a deepening work, a settling into um, our lives, the compassion of God. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. So this compassion is a thread all the way through our life with God. The Holy Spirit is constantly at work within us. He's administering and reminding us of the work of Jesus into our hearts, minds, bodies, and souls. And I like to think about this. As I was reading that verse, this, this, this scripture this week and over the last couple of weeks, I just kept having this picture of Jesus wandering around the, the towns and villages, as it were, within me, within my own life. And, and him going around within me and teaching. And him proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and him healing the disease and illness within me. And that's what he's doing in our lives over and over and over. He's, he's continually wanting to, uh, to, to um, apply the, the reality of what he's accomplished for us and remind us through the Spirit. He's up to this work because his heart is drawn to you, his heart is drawn to me, especially in the areas of, of your life that you'd rather not talk about. Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one that has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. So when we experience temptation, we have to remember that Jesus went all the way through that temptation. We, we eventually, when we give in to temptation, we don't feel, feel the full weight of the temptation, whereas Jesus did completely and fully. And, and he, he gets it. He understands what it is to be human. Uh, from the uh, author, Dane Ortlin, he says this, The reason that Jesus is in such close solidarity with us is that the difficult path we are on is not unique to us. He has journeyed on it himself. It is not only that Jesus can relive, relieve us from our troubles, like a doctor prescribing medicine. It is also that before any relief comes, listen to this, he is with us in our troubles, like a doctor who has endured the same disease. So Jesus moves towards us in our helplessness and wants to defend us from the harassment of the accuser. The Holy Spirit wants, wants to remind us of the truth of what Jesus has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection, that we are Christ, or put simply that what is true of Jesus is not true of us, the gospel of grace. So what we have to do, we have to keep coming back to this, is learn to sit and experience the God who is compassionate. Allow him to come and help us where we 
need it. Because the reality is this. We become like what we behold. So we just sit with the compassion of God before we even think about becoming compassionate to others. When we experience the, this compassion, then and only then do we become compassionate people. I like to think about this term. We must be careful not to take the cake out of the oven too soon. We don't want to serve a half bad cake. cake. We want not, I'm not saying we never get out there because like, I haven't fully loaded up on compassion, so maybe you know, when I'm 97, I'll get it. But like we have to just be careful to constantly be checking back. What is the source of what we're doing? We must be careful not to take the cake out of the oven too soon. We have to let God's compassion actually seep down deep into those most broken places of us of our life. So we so quickly want to pass this along to others before we let it take root, or at least see where it has taken root in our own lives and experiences. And so one of the ways we can pay attention to the depth of our revelation of the compassion of Jesus is our self-talk. So I want you to pay attention this week as you're sitting with God and as you're kind of trying to think through his heart moving towards you and what, when you screw up, because you're going to screw up this week, I want you to pay attention to, to what comes to your mind. What are you saying? Like, you idiot. I can't believe you did that. Or whatever. What's going on in there? Pay attention to what goes on in your mind when you feel helpless and harassed. Is the voice that comes through the voice that condemns, that confuses, that worries, that pushes, that rushes, that obsesses and frightens you? And instead, in that space, allow God's voice to come in. The voice that stills you and leads you and reassures you and enlightens you, enlightens you, encourages you and comforts you, calms you and convicts you. Allow the truth of the way that God sees you to reorganize your thoughts and beliefs and feelings and emotions to the point where you begin to see other people through the lens of compassion. So this would look like seeing others as helpless and harassed before seeing them as sinful and sinister. So we see the progression here, that when we're with, we need to be with compassion, we need to become compassionate people, and then we need to express compassion. This is the process. We can't just go out and express compassion without actually ourselves being with the God who is compassionate and allowing that compassion to, to take root in our lives, to actually reshape and reform how we think about ourselves and other people. Does that make sense? So, only then are we able to become people who live out the compassion of Christ in a real and tangible way. Where we're thinking about co-suffering with people, moving towards people, ministering grace and offering hope in the midst of their real human pain, telling them the good news of the compassionate and gracious God who stepped out of heaven and down to earth to rescue and redeem and reunite us with himself. Amen? All right, I'll close with this. Um, for those of you who love to read, I have a book recommendation. So this book is called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Orland, and the subtitle is this, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. I've read this a few times, and a few of us are reading it together right now. I, just, I highly recommend it, specifically in this kind of realm of the compassion and heart of Jesus. It does a, he does a brilliant job of unpacking it. So I would recommend that to you. And then I have a prayer practice for you to try. You might be like, hey, Tom, this is great. What are we actually going to be doing with this? Uh, how do I actually apply this to my life? And so we think about and talk about and encourage you guys often to, to, to take time just to be with God. We did this whole secret place challenge, and then we did the secret place 2.0 challenge. And so just hopefully some of us have a habit or rhythm of prayer so hopefully I'm not introducing something completely new, but just I wanted to kind of just share something I've been trying to do that I found is really changing how I see God, how I see myself, and how I see other people. And so um, this is a, it's really simple, but I, I think it could help us kind of look, land what we're talking about with the compassion of God. And so I'll, I'll just kind of walk you through the steps, and then we'll close with, with some prayer, and then we'll um, look at our kids and have a good day. So, like typically, when we go to, to be with God, I want you to start by finding a quiet space. When you're there, you get comfortable. I mean, for some of us, for I, I like to put my hands open just for the posture of receiving. And I want you to, when, when we're there, it's really simple. So you're there, your, your, your imagination is open. Good morning, God, or whatever. Come Holy Spirit, wherever you're going to pray. And I want you just to picture your inside, your heart, as like a window. So this window can only be open from the inside. Side. You actually have to do the opening yourself. And so as you open up that window, what you're slowly doing is you're allowing God to see you as you really are. All the parts that you 
you want to kind of keep hidden, you're slowly opening them up to God. So that picture, I that image, I would just love you to sit with. Like, what would it look like to open up the window fully to God and sit with Him? And how can His compassion, how can His grace and mercy come and meet you as you really are? So I'll send that out in an email tomorrow, just with some more steps. Just want to kind of prep you or prime you. If that's something, if you, if you feel stirred this morning, like, I, I want to do this, this could be an easy next step, just to kind of sit with God in that space. Sound good? Okay. So why don't I just, uh, I'll just pray for us to close. We're not going to sing a song to end today. And um, and then we will go from there. So if you guys want to stand, I'll just pray and ask God to, to reveal himself to us. Father, we are grateful today that we can come before you boldly because of what Jesus has done. He has cleansed us from all of our unrighteousness, that he has forgiven us completely, that he has rescued us and ransomed us and redeemed us. And so we come into your presence re rejoicing in what Jesus has done. And Lord, I thank you that that reality of the gospel, it, it has, it reverberates into our future, back into our past and into our present as well. And so, Lord, as we think about you, as we think about how to relate to you and how to relate to other people and how to be on your mission, I just pray, God, that we would never lose sight of who you actually are and what you're actually like. And so, Holy Spirit, I want to pray your protection over every heart and mind in this space, that as we go from here, that our picture of you, our understanding of you, our belief about who you are and what you're like would become more and more in line with your scriptures and more and more in line with who you really are. And so we bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come reveal Jesus to us. And Jesus, come and show us what your Father is really like. Show us your heart, Jesus. And may we carry your heart. May we be your hands and feet. May we be um, so overwhelmed and transformed by your compassion towards us that we become a compassionate people and so that we can express